Welcome to Thinking Through Making. This is a new podcast series by me, Emma Robinson, where I interview different makers and creators about their creative life and work. The first interview today is with Marina Skew. She is a knitwear designer and a yarn dyer from England who is creating really interesting nature inspired um, designs and yarns with provenance. So I hope you enjoy our conversation today and here we go. Hi Marina, welcome to this new podcast vloggy thingy where I chat to my friends about what they're making and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, it doesn't have a name yet so I don't know what this is going to be called. <laughs> vloggy interview type thing, yeah. <laughs> Um, so do you want to just tell us a bit about yourself, your background and how you got into design, dyeing yarn, natural dyeing, weaving, like just all of that stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm a, primarily a knitwear designer and yarn dyer, um, but I also dabble in loads of other crafts because I find that fun um, and I mostly share that kind of stuff on my podcast. Um, and I got into it all, like I came from a slightly crafty background, not necessarily like super creative, but my mom always like repaired clothes. She knew how to sew. She knew like the basics of knitting and the basics of crochet. And, um, and both of my grandmas knew how to knit and how to sew and everything. And so that was just kind of always around when I was growing up. And then I think I properly got into knitting in uni when <laughs> it was really, really, really cold and we couldn't afford to turn the heating on. So it's just like, <laughs> I have a lot of time while I'm like reading things. Um, so I started knitting then, but I didn't get into it in earnest until I was working full time. Um, and then everything kind of happened sort of all at once. Like I started dyeing yarn and spinning around the same time, like the end of 2015. Um, and both of those, like they showed up within a couple of weeks of each other. And like, once I started thinking about yarn creatively and like, not just being able to knit things with yarn that already exists, but actually decide what the yarn is like as well. Like that was mm. so exciting. Um, and I already had dyes and things in the house from like previous dye, uh, tie dye experiments and things. And I already had like some natural wool from, I think probably my grandma's stash that I had inherited because she wasn't going to be knitting with it. Um, and so it was like a very low stakes start to just see how it goes. And then the second I did it, it's like, I have to do more of this. <laughs> I have to do so much more. And like, I do get obsessive about stuff, which I think shows up in like how I've got more and more involved in like the processes behind the things I make. Mm -hmm. Um, and yet knitwear design I got into because I started just improvising things because I think it's quite common for knitwear designers to start designing because they can't find the things they want to knit. Um, and then a friend of mine, Becca, just sent me a call for submissions for Quince um, for a scarf collection that they were doing. And I thought, you know, I'll submit something and then I'll forget about it because there's no way it's going to be accepted. And so that'll be fine. I just feel better about myself for doing it. And then it was accepted and I was like, oh, well, apparently I'm a knitwear designer now. <laughs> and then I realized like it was a really nice sort of toe into the water because I just had to, like a lot of publications will have quite strict style guides. Um, whereas they just said, write out your instructions as clearly as possible and our pattern editors will put it into our style and everything. So it was a really nice way to sort of get started. Um, and since then I've worked as a tech editor, so I'm now obsessive about style because yes. you have to. 
Um, and your style is yeah. very like it feels to me very like homegrown, like homespun, like very earthy. And um, I always say about you, Marina, if like there's going to be an apocalypse, I'd want you to be in my uh, silo because <laughs> <laughs> you know it so much about everything. I yeah, I so I like I said that thing where I'm just obsessive about stuff. So you know, I started dyeing some yarn and then I realized that I didn't want to spin yarn because I thought you had to get a spinning wheel. And then just through Instagram, I saw people spinning on drop spindles and it's like, wait, you can spin yarn on a thing that's like this big and you can pack down and put in a pencil case. Like, that's amazing. And so I started spinning yarn. And of course I have two spinning wheels now. So. Um, <laughs> things escalate. Um, but I just, I've always been really interested in like how things are made. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like love plants, love spending time outside, noticing things in nature. And I think that comes a lot into my designs. Um, and also just the way I approach things. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah. When did you start? weaving then was that after you started the spinning and the dyeing or was that around the same time too that, that was after um so i started weaving on i started doing tapestries uh fairly shortly after i started dyeing um and i started making tapestries on a big old picture frame that the glass had smashed so i couldn't really use it for useful stuff so i got a nail gun and put loads of nails along two sides of the frame and just strung up crochet cotton and started making tapestries on that. Yeah. Um, and then I realized that was really annoying and slow yeah. and I wanted to be able to make things that weren't tapestries. Um, so I got a rigid heddle loom, which is quite a simple type of loom. Um, they're pretty easy to use and fairly inexpensive because I try to do things on as much of a budget as I can. I think a lot of the way I approach things is sort of driven by an inherent frugality. Um, Naturally. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, rigid heddle looms. I, mine is 24 inch wide. And so it's like it's a nice width. I can make an okay width of fabric on it. It's still quite narrow. Um, it's great for things like scarves, but um, I started then weaving stuff for sewing with, which is much more exciting to me because it's like I can do things that aren't just rectangles. Yeah. And actually the first fabric I wove that I knew I was going to sew something with rather than just leaving it as like a wrap or something was with your Jacob's yarn and my uh -huh. naturally dyed mendip. Oh cool um and do you want to just show us like what you're wearing on your bottom half? And yeah <laughs> just awkwardly stand up <laughs> um yeah so I'm because not able to show it very well but there we go. So like, this was hand spun and and Can I stand up oh, without killing my headphones? There we go. And died. And look at that nice little um, detail you have. Sorry, I was able to see inside your skirt. <laughs> yeah. So this is the selvage of the yeah. fabric. So we've got like no um, raw edges there. And then I tend to do facings so that like the only amount of um, fabric that you lose at the hem is like that much wide. Mm -hmm. um, and the facing, as I said, inherent frugality is old bed sheets. So, yeah, looks amazing. And um, I just looked there. Was that cutting the bias? I can't imagine you were cutting the bias. No, 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 um, no. It's um, it is three panels. Right. So, if you've got a long rectangle that you've woven, so these are the selvages. So this is the natural edge of the fabric. I cut a small section off the top, which became the waistband. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then the remaining fabric I cut into three this way mm -hmm. and sewed those sections next to each other um, to make something that instead of being long was wide, mm -hmm. but different proportions. Okay. Um, and then, so there are three seams. Okay. vertically in the skirt so there are two on the sides 
Um, where are we? There we go. So we've got a side seam on each and up here it's sort of enclosed in the pleat. Yeah. And then we've got the closure at the back with a zip. Uh-huh. So that would be what, like a three gore skirt or something then? What'd you call that? Uh, it, they're not gore, because gores are triangles. Okay. Um, it's, it's literally just a rectangle, it's basically just a rectangle with pleats. Oh, okay. um, so you, you can do the same yeah. thing with gathers, uh, okay. where you just gather at the waist, but I prefer pleats because they sit flatter. Um, so like with the pleats, because they sit, com they're, they're just the fabric folded over each other at the waist, they kind of then flare out. So you get a shape that's almost like an A-line. Okay. Whereas with gathers, if you gather at the waist all the way round, they're much more bulky. And so you end up with a shape that's more like that. And so yeah. it goes out a lot at the top, but then goes straight down. Yeah. Um, See, this which... is why I want you in my silo, Marina. We can survive and look good at the same time. <laughs> Yay! Well, I mean, I don't really know what I would add to the silo, to be honest, but... <laughs> You'd be great. You can do loads of I'll stuff. I'll bring Griffiths and he can catch our dinner. Exactly. I mean, yeah, if, if we need some hunting to happen, which we're, I'm going to have to reconsider the vegetarianism in the apocalypse, um, <laughs> <laughs> Rufus will be great to have on side. Um, and, you know, he can defend us from all the people competing for resources. <laughs> oh, dear. So... I don't know if I listened, or maybe we just chatted before about this. <clears throat> I know you mentioned before about um, the whole, like, kind of the relationship between how childcare works here and your kind of interest in slow living, and then the whole relationship with, like, work and productivity and creativity as well. Um, I don't, we were maybe just chatting about this on the phone or something, I can't remember now, maybe via text message it was. Or yeah, something. Uh, yeah, because we, we've both, like, we've talked a lot about slow living and how to sort of just take down the pace of things and, you know, while I... I find a lot of value in being productive and feeling productive and having spending my time in a way that at the end of that period of time I can see what I've achieved like mm. I find that really motivating and like making something physical whether it's clothes or fabric or yarn or food or a basket or something in the garden like I find that like it makes me feel connected to things um and Side note, I think that's a really good thing for mental health. Like, I think a lot of the world today is really difficult because people are so disconnected from what actually keeps them alive. Like, mm -hmm. if you're spending your time doing a job in an office where someone's paying you to do a thing that fundamentally for survival doesn't really matter, and then that money goes to paying your rent or your mortgage and buying your food, like, there's so much disconnect. But then it, just taking like a tiny bit of that process back, even if it's growing potatoes in a bin outside your back door, like then eating those potatoes and having had your time go into making something that's going to sustain you or keep you warm. Like, I love that, that yeah. it, it, it just feels real. And yeah. so that is like my driving motivator in life and then you chuck a child into that <laughs> who is absolute chaos and he, he, you know you can't you you can't do a lot of things around him because he will destroy them um like there is lots of stuff i can do but and it's at the point where he will help me like rinse yarn uh, which is adorable but not actual help yes <laughs> um and so you have to sort of shift priorities because like a lot of it is the the housework thing like i hate housework people always ask me how i like get so much textile stuff done i don't like tidying i put it off for as long as possible and then when people are coming around i panic and try to sort it out 
<laughs> but when I spend like a morning getting the house presentable, it used to be that I'd have like a couple of weeks before it started looking terrible again. Whereas now I get about half an hour. Yeah. So I it's, feel your pain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just all the toddler mess is quite draining. And that means things like where I used to hand make pasta and sit there and roll gnocchi in the evening that sort of thing has been temporarily put aside like, yeah. because I I just have I've just had to realign how I look at how my time is spent and you know a, a, a lot of it has to go to looking towards a, another human being which is nurturing in its own regard um yeah. and yeah it's it's required a shift and like with work um I've had to try to be a lot better about prioritizing because when I was just working full time and able to spend my time how I chose, um, like it, it was much easier to kind of indulge in that slow thing and do things in a way that felt nourishing and meaningful. Whereas now I have three days a week where he's at nursery and so in the days he's not at nursery, I'm trying to work out how best to structure like my day and what things are most urgent to try and address. Um, and having like set windows of time, like, okay, I've got probably an hour and a half of nap time in which I can try and achieve things. What am I going to do in that time that is the most do you, useful? Do you feel like that inhibits your creativity or like, does it make it does it make you more creative? Because I, I think it I makes. That, I find that it makes it me a little bit. Because I'm like so pressured on the time available. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's taken me. I'm still. There's still stuff I don't really do that I used to really enjoy. So I don't. I used to go out for a nice, decent walk a few times a week, and I don't really do that now. Like we'll go for a little toddle around the village and stuff but when you're looking after a toddler it's not like calming time in nature it's <laughs> no it's okay the lorry can't get you <laughs> um so yeah it it has it's meant again that some things have kind of just been put to the side for a bit but slowly i'm trying to bring them back in mm. like I used to do more events um, and go and like attend things and meet up with people. Whereas now it, it kind of feels like, no, you have to sit at your computer and, or, you know, work on things that are for commissions. And you have like, there's that constant consideration of where is the money? You have this much outgoing on having the child in nursery. How are you going to make sure that you've earned that back today? Which is, a very real consideration as a small business owner and is you know it is nice to think that you know you spend your time doing lovely creative things but a lot of the time it's sort of trying to balance opportunities that are the sort of thing you're really excited about and the sort of things that are paying the bills not that they're mutually exclusive like they can be both, but also sometimes you have to make compromises. Um, so yeah, like it's, I'm not doing things a hundred percent the way I would like to at the moment, just in terms of, I don't get as much time in nature, um, but that's okay. Cause I'm still doing work that I love and I'm slowly reintroducing the things I like. I'm going to more events, um, I'm trying to balance like family time with time spent actually meeting people and getting out of the house because yes. you get isolated. Oh, Marina, I feel like we're in such a similar position right now. Like, I feel exactly yeah. about you about the whole childcare work thing. Like, you kind of want to do things that'll make you thrive, but at the same time, you're like, oh crap, like, I need to make some money here. Mm -hmm. And there, to me, there's like, it feels like a really weird. Because before um, I had my daughter, like I worked during the day, but then I had the whole of like from when I got up until 
I started work like half nine, like nine, half nine. That's like two hours that I could have done. I went for a walk. I did all, like, I could have knitted. I could have done whatever I wanted. And then I also had the time from when I finished work until dinner time. And I had no bedtime to do. So I had all like another three hours that I could have done whatever I wanted. So I suppose like to me, now the way I used to have some margin in my day, as people like to say, I had all these extra spaces where I could like think about things or yeah. remember things. And like when I was going for my walks, I was kind of processing like the creative things as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, you need time to buffer. I, I just do things. I, I have no buffer. And I feel like that makes me less creative. And it I'm feels like you're constantly being reactive and doing things in a very short sighted way. I find like I, you're, you're you're thinking about a bigger picture today and what you can achieve today, but not like pursuing what is effective now. But that often doesn't leave time for looking at things in a longer term perspective and things that are going to b benefit you in a more like business development way and yeah and, and like i something i think about is um hannah lisa of making stories um she is quite open and outspoken about the fact that she takes time working on her business instead of in her business so she will take days where she's not doing the like computer admin like running the magazine work she's doing the visionary stuff the strategic planning and the goal setting and seeing where she wants to be taking things and i'm trying to think more about that now like it feels like if i say it feels like things are getting easier something's gonna happen um it does feel like um yeah, you know, we're slowly finding a balance and it's taking a long time. And obviously with little ones, it things change constantly. Um, but it feels like I'm getting more into things and I'm starting to be able to take a longer term perspective. Like I'm working on stuff now that's going to be either published or released or whatever next autumn. And that's a long way ahead to be thinking about stuff but that longer term planning like is forcing me to try and be a bit more strategic about things and how i look at where i'm going and i think that's helping um it's making me feel less sort of flying by the seat of my pants trying to get through the day and more like how am i working towards my like medium term goals and so how do that you then fit in the things that like make you thrive as a creative person? Like you talked about like doing things, you know, that connect you to what it means to be a human. Like growing the potatoes, like weaving, like knitting, like the stuff that's not necessary, but the stuff that's necessary for you to thrive. Like how do you make time for that? And how do you give yourself that time? So I distinguish between work projects and not work projects. Um, so design projects um, that I'm either going to publish myself or especially ones that are commissions that I'm getting a fee for that are going to be published by someone else. That counts as work knitting. But like the little cardigan I'm making for my kid, like that's personal knitting and that'll happen either in the evening or on weekends. Um, so like the time the boy is out of the house, that's a hundred percent like work stuff. Um, sometimes like there is a bit of a balance provided by the fact that, um, I have a Patreon and I produce videos and content for that. And those things are often personal projects that I record and share there. And so that's a way of basically other people who like the things I make, who maybe don't have time to do them themselves or want to learn more about what I'm doing. Cause I, I do a lot of different crafts. Um, and I try to make my videos sort of slightly instructive, but also inspirational. Um, and that allows me some time 
to dedicate to those projects as well. Uh, but things like the weaving, I mostly did in the evening once the boy had gone to bed. Um, in fact, yeah, it was pretty much all while he was sleeping. Um, so done in the evenings, often while my husband is like either catching up on some work from during the day or playing video games or something. Um, and you know, I play video games in the evening, but our PlayStation is super, super old. So every time it has to load something, you just sit there for five minutes. So that's Rose I can be getting in on my knitting. So multitasking there is <laughs> finding those tiny, tiny bits of time that you can fit like a few stitches in or a few picks in on the weaving. Um, but then do you not feel sometimes like you just kind of need time just to do nothing? Um, I, I don't, I don't give that to myself, but like, no, I, I start I, my I, day slowly. I'm not a morning person. Um, and so, you know, I will do some of my social media stuff, like before I get up, I'll, I'll just get up slowly. Um, and l sort of allow myself like a little window of time there. I don't have an alarm set so I wake up like usually a bit after um, my husband takes the boy to nursery and I'll just have a bit of time before I get up to just be like okay before I have my coffee and start staring at a computer screen or like <laughs> usually stare at the computer screen while knitting and trying to get some stitches in on samples um, I have a little bit of time then and I do allow like knitting time I think is it's almost nothing time to me yeah. I try to have and do you watch something while you're knitting or listen to something or just silence I it very rarely complete silence um I will often have a podcast on um or just a bit of like very, very low key music. Um, like <laughs> I did my Apple music replay thing yesterday and my top artists were Jeremy Sewell who composed the Skyrim soundtrack. Video game soundtracks are great music for concentrating because they're specifically designed to be ambient, but not intrusive. They're designed to help you concentrate. Mm -hmm. um, Skyrim soundtrack loads of Vaughan Williams and Howard Shaw, who did the Lord of the Rings soundtrack. So I have soundtracks and classical music on in the background, things that are fairly like pleasant, but unintrusive. Um, and that, well, that just helps me not pay attention to like the sounds of the heating and stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Which I find, like, if I'm just listening to every tiny weird noise that our old house is making, I, yeah. Um, so yeah, either music or podcast, but the music tends to be very, very chilled and, yeah. Oh, but that's, we've got some nice recommendations there that we can go and listen to. <laughs> yeah, because um, usually I, when I knit in the evenings, I knit with, like, a podcast on, like, a on YouTube or something like that. Mm -hmm. but one night I decided I was too like overstimulated and I just like yeah. everything off and I sat there and I was like a lot more quickly I decompressed than if yeah. I yeah 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 me again so that was kind of interesting and I haven't done it since but I kind of want to explore it more so, yeah and one one thing I used to do a lot more when I was going out for walks a lot more um which I've done a couple of times more recently and really want to do more and I imagine there will be more of next year because um going out to the woods and sitting and knitting in the woods for a while is yeah. is just nice um it's it's then you can listen to the birds and that's sort of it mostly birds in the summer it's insects but now it would just be robins and blackbirds shouting at each other because they don't want me to be there but eventually they'll get used to me and then it'll be fine yeah. um and yeah, so that that was always a really nice way to decompress, and especially in winter when you can bundle up in hundreds of layers and sit cosy at the bottom of a tree. Yeah. Um, 
and you know you don't sit there for hours because then your joints seize up and you can't get up <laughs> Even twice, so good. But yeah, just that that time to decompress and getting out of the house and having a bit of a walk to get there is just really nice. But again, that's a treat um, yeah. and not something I get to do that often. But next year we're having building work done on the house, so things are going to be very loud and I'm probably going to want to get out of the house a lot more. So I think I will be doing more of that to actually be able to hear myself think. Yeah. So kind of going on from that, I would like to ask you a little bit um, about your garden plans, because I know you're really into gardening and you moved yeah. house and you slightly moved gardens, didn't you take some stuff with you? What's the yes. plans for your new garden in spring 2024? And how does that like crossover with any of your designs or like anything like that? Yeah, OK. Um. So yeah i had to bring some of the old garden with me because we moved when we, we had a three month old baby which was not easy um and a week and a half before we moved where our landlord had previously said because we moved from a rented house into this house that we bought um we had checked with our landlord because we'd done loads to the garden at the old house like it was basically a yeah, housing estate rectangle and it had grass and a fence and a shed at the end um and we asked if we'd be able to grow some veg and stuff and they were like yeah sure it's a blank canvas do what you want and so we basically turned half of it into beds like ornamental nearer the house and then veg beds further away um and they had said that that was fine and that we could just leave those and that was all good. And then a week and a half before we were due to leave, they said that they wanted the big bed in the middle of the garden turned back to lawn. And so that meant digging up everything, putting it in pots. And like we ended up putting them in old compost bags and stuff because we didn't have pots big enough to move things. Um, so I was digging everything up while I've got a tiny baby lying on the grass next to me. Um, and so I ended up having to make garden decisions here much sooner than I expected yeah. because I suddenly had all of these plants that I needed to put in the ground quite quickly because they had been hoiked out of the ground and then needed to, they couldn't stay in the compost bags. Um, so I created a little border in front of the house and gradually with the front garden, I've been doing more and more. So I've changed it quite a lot now. Um, we were lucky that we already had some established shrubs there and things and quite a few roses, but we bought this house from a chap who I think had inherited it from his mother. And I think his mother must have been a very keen gardener, but he was not. And so there were lots of like rose plants that had been completely cut down to the ground and things that had just been mown over. So it took quite a while to work out what was actually here. Yeah. So the first year I didn't do all that much because, you know, small baby and also like renovations because I spent most of my maternity leave like stripping wallpaper and plastering and painting. And um, But then this year I've done it keeps feeling like I've not done any gardening, but that's because usually around midsummer, I lose enthusiasm for gardening. Like I get more excited about it when I'm trying to make things happen because I don't, I don't do well in winter. I think it's part of the reason I'm so like keen on knitwear and all the cozy stuff is trying to make winter better. Um, and so round about, February I'm usually like okay it's it's time to get on with garden stuff and it, let's okay let's start some chili seeds we can do that really early uh let's start some onion seeds let's get those going um at the moment I've just been focusing on like ornamental stuff in the front garden we do have a back garden but it's sort of completely neglected at the moment because there just isn't the time but I am hoping that next year we might get some stuff growing out there but it really depends how our building work goes but I will be trying to make the front garden very nice because that's what people have to walk through and past to get to our front door and I see that every day and it's what I see out the window there um, and so having that be a nice place is 
really enjoyable. And as you said, I take a lot of inspiration from the garden in my designs, lots of leafy stuff, um, and even stuff that is slightly less obviously inspired by plants. Like I've got placatum mitts and a hat, which is a cable pattern that um, is inspired by like the ridges on the leaves of viburnum placatum, which is a really nice shrub that has beautiful like lacy white flowers and amazing autumn foliage. Um, and so there is a lot of that, like I'm obsessed with just little planty details and yeah. And would you like to show us your hedge bind? Um... Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> talking about, about planty that. details. Um, so this is a design I'm working on for issue 12 of Making Stories magazine. Um, and the theme is Art Nouveau, which is something I've taken a lot of inspiration from. I mean, this one, which I haven't actually talked about, but this is your yarn. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's there's a lot of like late um 18th uh, no sorry late 19th early 20th century inspiration in my work um and this one try and get far enough back that you can properly see it um is is inspired by bindweed so it's called hedge bind because we have bindweed growing up through our, through our hedge at the bottom of the garden and it's a nightmare um so these are the bindweed flowers and then these are the really distinctive like arrow shaped leaves I know. um I know. and yeah <laughs> <laughs> and like all these vines sort of curling around each other are kind of the way it all twists and gets entangled and basically tries to strangle everything else um and it's a funny one because i i love bindweed as a child i loved bindweed as a plant like the flowers are completely beautiful the petals are so delicate i always wanted to make a dress out of the petals like did did you know flower fairies when you were little like the books that are inspired by specific plants and flowers but she they're, they're like very pretty illustrations um yeah. that are inspired by specific flowers turned into little fairies and the bindweed fairy was so so pretty Oh. Um, but then as a gardener, nightmare, hate it, terrible yeah. plant. Yeah. And so it's that, but also it's still beautiful. And so it's yeah. sort of celebrating that. And also, yeah, they are very pretty. So obviously I don't have sleeves on here yet, but I will have sleeves. Yeah. I've got my steak round here. I will be picking up stitches and we'll have the same um, stitch pattern as this, just on the sleeves. And, and, and it's so it's such a large motif like it it must have been difficult to come like to design that it i've worked on it for far longer than i've ever worked on a chart before like it, yeah. it was a whole process there was lots and lots of sketching and iterations and like some elements i worked on separately like trying to find a leaf motif that would fit nicely, but didn't have too long floats in the stitches. Um, trying to find a nice um, a flower motif that would sort of work symmetrically. Um, so those elements I worked on separately, but then the overall structure, I did lots of sketching to find like a composition that I would like. Yes. Um, that sort of feels balanced and interesting and also flows because it's all about how the lines flow together. Um, and then, yeah, lots of sketching. Often I'll do things in square paper, but this was in Stitch Mastery, which is the uh, software I use to make charts and lots of sketching and iterations and copying sections and moving them around. I had a much bigger chart set up than I knew I actually needed with a border drawn around it. And then I had like little working areas around the side where I could sort of drop things in and move them around. Um, and I also did an under sketch in a different color and then went over and refined it in the color that I was going to use and then like deleted out the sketch color. And yeah, it was, it was complex, but really, really fun. 
So do you want to tell us about any upcoming things that we can look out for um, that's coming up and anything exciting currently in your shop that you could tell us about? Yeah, sure. So I, I suspect it'll already be going by the time this is out for people to watch. Um, but I've got my out of the dark make along starting on January the 1st. Um, and I tend to run that every year from New Year's Day to the spring equinox. And I mentioned I don't do well in the winter. And it's a way of just bringing some joy to the like latter half of the dark season. Um, so it's a make along using any of my passions or yarn or fiber, just any marina skewer stuff. Um, and sharing on either on Instagram or in my patron exclusive discord server. And people can share projects using the hashtag out of the dark Mao 2024. Um, and there will be prizes and it's going to be lovely. Um, it's a thing I look forward to every year because I, yes, it's to bring joy to everyone else, but also I get to see the things they're making with my stuff, which is like one of the nicest things about like not making finished things, but making things that other people can take and turn into something themselves. Like, I love that. Um, so yes, that is coming up. Um, I've also got a huge batch of my Mendip yarn arriving at some point in the next couple of weeks because I'm running low. Yay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So that one is ore on the sunny base. So I dye my Mendip yarn on both a white base, which is the sunny one and a gray base um which is the cloudy one and i dye the same colors on both so you get color pairs which is really nice for like creating a color palette um for things like stranded knitting um and i'm also going to be doing lots more limited edition colors because they're super fun and i have another batch coming in of my skewer blend which is a blend of british wool breeds um created for me by wingham wool work is what my skirt is made of mm. um so this is i dyed the fabric the fiber for the warp but then left the weft undyed so it's a natural sorry for any rustling but like a natural brownie gray Mm. And so it's a blend of five different breeds. So we've got Cheviot, Manx Lochten, Jacobs, Dorset Horn, and Teeswater. And each of them is a different color. And it's kind of a blend I've created to be exactly the features I like in spinning fiber. Um, so, you know, completely self-absorbed. Um, <laughs> just create create things that I really like and hope other people do as well. Well, um, and exactly I've been... the right thing to do, Marina. Huh? <laughs> that's exactly the right thing to do. They always yeah, yeah. at uni, they're always like, if you make something interesting, other people will find it interesting too. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so yeah, it's lovely to spin with. Um, I honestly didn't expect to make this skirt so quickly, but I just got obsessed with the spinning and then it's like, well, I'm going to have to make something with it now. Yeah. Um, and so I've been dying on that. I don't actually have any of the dyed fiber to hand at the moment, um, but I'm running slightly low on stock with those, but I will have lots more colors coming out at some point soon. And I should hopefully have some with me at Unravel um, in February. I don't remember the exact weekend it is, but I will be at Unravel and hopefully I will have some hand dyed fiber with me. Mm. Um, and then what else am I working on? Yeah, so I, I am a, mem a, a member of an organization called Fibershed. I don't do you know about fiber shed emma yes i'm not a member of it but i know about it yeah okay um so for people who haven't heard of it very briefly it's um the idea of creating sort of regional textile kind of supply chains and infrastructure but connecting up local textile makers um from you know farmers who are growing wool or flax or in the states like cotton 
um, to mill who are processing it, to people like us who are dyeing it or designing with it. Um, and the aim is to try and create that network within a specific geographic area. So I'm in the Southwest England fiber shed. Um, and so I'm in the early stages of working on a collection that will be using 100% West Country grown and spun and everything, um, yarns. So I'm going out and visiting farms and, you know, meeting their mostly sheep because yeah. they do a lot of stuff with wool, uh, meeting the sheep, seeing what their landscape is. And because Fiber Shed has quite rigorous sort of environmental and ecological standards, like you have to be not necessarily, not organically certified, but doing things in a way that is respectful of the land. Mm -hmm. um, and so going to see the farms and hearing some of their stories and taking inspiration from that and their land and taking that into the designs. Mm -hmm. So I've had a bit of funding to go towards that, to be able to like visit these farms that are going to be all over the West Country. Um, I've had my first farm visit at this point and a farm like literally 15 minutes drive down the road. Um, and they're doing beautiful work. They've got um, Dorset Horn and Shetland and I think some Jacob sheep. Um, and they've got some beautiful yarn and they're also creating a wetland corridor Mm -hmm. So they're on quite a slope on their farm and apparently all the water runoff goes into the river and then where the river goes beyond their land, it tends to flood quite badly. And so they are, they've done a load of groundworks in some of their fields, creating sort of channels and then they're creating like leaky dams so they're putting a load of brushwood and logs and planting a lot of water loving trees and plants to slow down the water flow and it'll also create some wetland habitat which is really really it at risk now because you know we used to have loads of natural ponds and things and those have slowly been declining and so they're creating habitat but also doing something that's great for the landscape and those are the kind of stories i'm really excited about as well as the yarn itself and so i'm kind of trying to take all of that into consideration with the yarn and so within the collection i'm going to be telling the stories of the farms where the yarn comes from and like hopefully encourage people to think more about where their yarn comes from. And, you know, if, if you have a fiber shed network near you, like looking at it and seeing who's producing wool, whose products you can use that are doing things in an environmentally beneficial way, and just kind of have more connection in our crafting, because that's what I really, really love. So it's a project I'm super, super excited about. And I'm in the early stages, but I can't wait to see how it develops. Mm -hmm. Ah, that sounds so exciting. I love, I would, I would love to listen to all those stories. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, uh, it's going to be an interesting one trying to present them in a way that's not like really bogged down and like, okay, can we just get to the knitting pattern? <laughs> but <laughs> um, trying to tell them in an engaging way, um, and bring that into the designs themselves. I think it's going to be really fun. Yeah, sounds so good. Sounds like an amazing collection of designs and stories and all of that stuff. So thank you very much for joining me today on this nameless thing that I, <laughs> um, I always enjoy our chat. So thanks so much for coming on and um, being part of this. Yeah, thank you. It's been really, really lovely to catch up. Yep. You can find Marina's work on her website, marinaskew.com. You can also find her on Ravelry as Marina Skew, on her Patreon, um, just patreon.com forward slash Marina Skew. And you can find her on Instagram as Marina Skew as well. I'm going to put all the links below so you can check them out if you want to. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today and hopefully see you next time. Bye.